Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second episode of this series, Tennessee Resting Places. The first episode on the Reeves family plot at Oak Hill Cemetery in Johnson City was really a spur-of-the-moment creation. I happened to be on my way to a family event in North Carolina from my home in Middle Tennessee, and I thought I would stop to see the grave of my great-great-great-grandfather, who I am currently researching for my family history blog. I was walking back to my car after paying my respects when I walked past the Reeves family grave. As part of my family history research, I had become familiar with the Reeves family, and it just so happened that I was in a position where I was able to make a few off-the-cuff remarks about them. After I shot my selfie video, it occurred to me that it might make for the beginning of an interesting series. So, for the second episode, I thought I would be a little more intentional in my work. So here we go, the first episode of this uh, newly relaunched series, uh, the second episode of the series in total, uh, is the first of a two-parter about one of the more famous cemeteries in Nashville, Mount Olivet Cemetery. Mount Olivet Cemetery is located southeast of downtown Nashville on Lebanon Pike, south of the Cumberland River and north of Interstate 40, just west of Spence Lane. The cemetery itself is built on a hill overlooking the city. Interments began at this cemetery in late 1855. The Mount Olivet Cemetery Company was established in September of 1855 to own and maintain the cemetery grounds. The cemetery corporation's first president was Adrian V.S. Lindsley, a prominent Nashville lawyer, and other prominent Nashville citizens were involved in the business as well. Nashville grew rapidly in the early decades of the 19th century. The city population doubled between 1830 and 1850 and boomed from about 10,000 people in 1850 to about 17,000 in 1860. As the population of living Nashvilleans rose, so too did the number of the dead. And by the mid-1850s, its older cemeteries were filling up. The opening of the new cemetery was thus of great importance to the city, and was received warmly by its citizens. The editors of one of the daily newspapers in Nashville declared that nature could scarcely have formed a more appropriate city for the dead. When first opened, Mount Olivet Cemetery covered about 125 acres, but today it has nearly doubled in size as it has expanded to the south and east. Many of the older memorials in the north part of the cemetery that's facing Lebanon Pike are of a Gothic Revival style, with a mix of simple headstones as well as obelisks and crypts that are quite ornate. According to the Tennessee State Library and Archives, Mount Olivet was originally created for, and catered to, Nashville's white Protestant elite, and many of the memorials there reflect the wealth and privilege of that class. During the Jim Crow era from 1889 until the 1960s, black Tennesseans were entirely excluded from burial in the cemetery. Before, there were some slaves and servants that were buried there as well, but for the most part, it was prominent white people. And then after the 1960s, of course, we had integration. Now, there's a Catholic cemetery right next door that's Calvary Cemetery, and it opened in 1868. And while the two cemeteries are legally separate, It's quite easy to walk from one into the other. There's no direct driving path, but you can walk across the grounds quite easily. And if I do revisit Mount Olivet in the future, I'll probably also do an episode on the Catholic Cemetery. Now, in this episode, we're going to focus on memorials at Mount Olivet that are related to the Civil War, particularly those of Confederate soldiers, although there also were some Union soldiers who are buried at Mount Olivet. I recognize that Confederate monuments are a painful subject for some people today. As we will see, this is not entirely a new issue. While I am not going to go into my personal politics in this video, I may address the subject in more detail at another time, depending on the reception of this video. Now for those whom I haven't scared off with that introduction, let's start our tour of Mount Olivet by driving up the main road into the cemetery starting at the entrance on Lebanon Pike. As we get to near the top of the hill, we will see several crypts. Just past these crypts is a marker placed by the Sons of Confederate Veterans for Brigadier General George Earl Maney, and his grave is the first stop on our tour. 
George Maney was born in Williamson County, Tennessee in 1826. He was the son of a local judge and was well-educated himself. Though not a career soldier, Maney volunteered for the Army, that's the U.S. Army, during the Mexican War. In the 1850s, he practiced law and was a prominent Nashville area member of the Whig Party. At the outbreak of the Civil War, Maney helped organize and was made colonel of the 1st Tennessee Infantry Regiment. This unit formed in May 1861, which was a month before Tennessee actually voted to secede. At the Battle of Shiloh, Maney was placed in charge of a brigade and shortly after was promoted to Brigadier General, the rank that he held throughout the war. Maney's brigade fought at Perryville, Murfreesboro, Chickamauga, Missionary Ridge, and in the Atlanta Campaign. Due to injuries he received in battle, Maney was relieved of command in 1864 and was not an active field commander from that point on, though he did remain in the Army of Tennessee until it surrendered in May 1865 in North Carolina. After the war, George Maney returned to Nashville. He was president of the Tennessee and Pacific Railroad for several years. He also re-entered politics as a Republican. He represented Davidson and Cheatham counties in the Tennessee State Senate. He also served as a United States ambassador to several South American countries under Republican presidents. George Maney died in Washington, D.C. in 1901. He is buried in a plot with his parents and brothers. His wife, Elizabeth Crutcher Maney, is buried in Louisville, Kentucky. The next grave as we move up the cemetery road is that of William Nelson Rector Beale. In many ways, Beale's life contrasted with that of George Maney. Unlike Maney, William Beale was not a Tennessee native. He was born in Kentucky in 1825 and moved to Arkansas as a teenager. Shortly after, both of his parents died. Despite being an orphan, though, Beale was able to earn an appointment to the United States Military Academy at West Point. He graduated 30th out of a class of 38 cadets in 1848. Beale was not involved in the Mexican War. His military career before the Civil War mainly involved fighting Indians out west. Beale moved from post to post with the Army while slowly rising through the ranks. Notably, Beale remained in the U.S. Army well after the southern states seceded. He did not resign his captain's commission in the U.S. Army until late August 1861, several weeks after the Battle of First Manassas. During the Civil War, Beale's talents leaned toward administration and logistics. Perhaps the most noteworthy event involving Beale was his surrender of Port Hudson, Louisiana, in July 1863. Beale and his troops were sent northward as prisoners. As a prisoner of war, General Beale took a leadership role in helping to obtain needed supplies to his fellow Confederate POWs. After the end of the war, William Beale settled in St. Louis, Missouri, and worked as a merchant. There he attained some success. He courted and married Felicia Bass, the much younger daughter of Nashville Mayor John Bass. Unfortunately for Beale, his health failed him as he entered middle age. He moved from St. Louis to McMinnville, Tennessee in 1883 in an attempt to find a healthier climate, but he died shortly thereafter at the age of 58. As we follow the road around a right-hand turn, the next marker will become visible. The marker is for General Benjamin Franklin Frank Cheatham. Somewhat confusingly, the SCV marker is near a large stone marked Cheatham that is just off the path, but these graves are for the family of one of his nephews. Frank Cheatham's, the the General Frank Cheatham's actual grave, is a small one that is set back about 100 feet away from the road. Also, while we're clearing things up, Cheatham County in Tennessee is not named after General Frank Cheatham, but after a second cousin of his who served in the state legislature. Frank Cheatham was born in 1820. As you may have guessed by now, the Cheathams were a very prominent family in Middle Tennessee, and one scholar described Frank's kin as an opulent, slaveholding family. Not only were Cheatham cousins involved in state politics, but his maternal grandfather, James Robertson, was one of the founders of Nashville. Frank's father, Leonard, was a planter and postmaster in Nashville during James K. Polk's presidency. Cheatham's first military command came during the Mexican War, when he was elected captain of a company of volunteers called the Nashville Blues. After fighting in Mexico, Cheatham moved to California, where he opened a hotel catering to the booming population. 
While there, he seemed to have been involved in politics to some degree. A few years later, Cheatham moved back to Nashville, and that's when he became really deeply involved in the Democratic Party politics of Tennessee. During the secession crisis of 1861, Tennessee Governor Isham Harris, who was a friend of Frank Cheatham, appointed him as a brigadier general in the state's provisional army, which later was folded into the Confederate armed forces. Cheatham was a political general, lacking formal military education, though he is generally considered a competent commander. As a stern disciplinarian, which resulted from some bad experiences he had in the Mexican War, he uh, may have had some soldiers who resented him. And he also had a troubled relationship with Braxton Bragg, who commanded the Army of Tennessee for much of 1862 and 1863. But Frank Cheatham did win respect from his men for his skill and bravery, frankly, in leading them forward in hard-fought battles such as Perryville and Missionary Ridge. Cheatham himself was wounded in combat at the Battle of Shiloh in 1862, shortly after his promotion to Major General. By the time the Army of Tennessee surrendered in May 1865, Cheatham commanded an entire corps and was outranked only by Joseph E. Johnston. Cheatham married Annabelle Robertson in 1866. Annabelle was no relation to Frank, but he was a daughter of one of his wartime aides. They had five children. One son, Frank Jr., grew up to be a major general in the U.S. Army during the Spanish-American and World War I. After the war, Cheatham tried farming. The Reconstruction-era disenfranchisement of Confederates did drive him to become active again in politics. He ran for an at-large congressional seat in 1872 as a Democrat, but lost in a three-way race. Later, he was superintendent of the state prison, and thus involved in the controversial convict lease system where those imprisoned could be hired out as laborers. He also briefly served as postmaster of Nashville in his final years. Frank Cheatham died in 1886. His funeral and other events marking his passing were well attended and many tributes praising Cheatham were printed across the state of Tennessee. Now at this point in our tour, we are straight on the path to the main area memorializing the Confederate war dead known as Confederate Circle. And from this point on in the video, I'm going to truncate my commentary about individual soldiers to avoid repetition and tedium. As we head south along the path, there are several graves marked by SCV plaques. On the right, there is the crypt of Rachel Carter, a diarist who's writing during the federal occupation of Nashville. Further down and to the left is the grave of William Brimage Bate, who came from humble origins in Middle Tennessee and was one of the political generals like Frank Cheatham. While there are several stories that attest to his personal toughness and fighting spirit, such as pulling a pistol on a surgeon who attempted to amputate his leg, ironically, Bate was a far more successful politician and a much less fortunate commander on the battlefield than his contemporaries, such as Frank Cheatham. Bate had six horses shot out from underneath him during the war, including three on a single day during the Battle of Chickamauga, and he received injuries that left him with permanent disabilities. But in the 1880s, Bate was elected governor of Tennessee as a Democrat on a populist platform that took on railroad interests. He then served in the United States Senate until his death in 1905. Finally on the left, before we arrive at Confederate Circle, is the grave of 1860 presidential candidate John Bell. Bell was born in Davidson County, the son of a blacksmith. He practiced law in Middle Tennessee before entering politics. John Bell was elected to Congress and served seven terms between 1827 and 1841. Early in his congressional career, Bell was a supporter of Andrew Jackson. During John Bell's early years in Congress, he was involved in one of our nation's saddest episodes when he authored the Indian Removal Act, but he began to realize the benefit of Henry Clay's ideas about internal improvements, and how they could help profit the merchant class in Nashville. So he accepted the support of opposition congressmen in 1833 to become Speaker of the House, thus basically crossing Andrew Jackson. And from that point on, we tend to think of John Bell as a Whig Party politician. Bell briefly served as Secretary of War under William Henry Harrison before resigning in protest when John Tyler became president. For several years, 
Bell sat on the sidelines of politics until 1847, when he was able to secure the necessary support in the Tennessee General Assembly to become a United States Senator. During his two terms in the Senate, the sectional rift between North and South became dangerously heated. After the passing of Daniel Webster and Henry Clay, it fell on men like Bell to lead the Whig Party and to defend national interests. Though Bell was a slave owner himself, he cast votes against admitting Kansas as a slave state. Despite Bell's principled stand, the Whig Party, well, it went the way of the Whigs, and by 1860, only a rump faction remained, which organized itself as the Constitutional Union Party. The new party nominated Bell, and while he won Tennessee, he was no longer relevant in national politics. In the first few months after Lincoln's election, Bell strongly opposed efforts to split Tennessee from the Federal Union and supported peace talks between North and South. But the firing on Fort Sumter in April, and Lincoln's call for troops, and the fear, frankly, on the part of the Southerners of a Northern invasion, caused Bell to abandon the Union cause. Tennessee seceded two months later. After secession, Bell retired from public life and focused on his business affairs. John Bell died in 1869 at the age of 73. During that turbulent year, many Tennesseans seem to have regretted that moderate voices had not prevailed during the secession debates of 1861. Former Tennessee Governor Gustavus Henry, who had served in the Confederate Senate, eulogized John Bell, writing, Had he been elected, what woes unnumbered would have been spared to this land? Tennessee ought to be proud of the fame of John Bell and to protect it forever. He was her own and favorite son and the wisest of all her citizens. Speaking of woes unnumbered, we come at last to Confederate Circle. In and around the circle are the final resting places for about 1,500 Confederate soldiers, some of whose graves are unmarked. The first Confederate burials at Mount Olivet occurred while the Civil War was still raging. During the war, the Union Army used some of the cemetery for an encampment while occupying Nashville. After the war, many of the Confederate dead rested in hastily made graves, either on the battlefields where they fell or in overfilled cemeteries like the Nashville City Cemetery. Then as now, the U.S. government paid for the proper burial of Union soldiers. But the Confederate war dead, considered traitors by their government, received no such benefit. In 1867, the city of Nashville reached an agreement with Mount Olivet to move about 275 soldiers' graves from the city cemetery. In 1869, a group of ex-Confederates and prominent ladies of Nashville raised money to purchase Confederate Circle, with enough room to bury up to 2,000 soldiers. Over the following months and years, soldiers were reinterred at Mount Olivet. Later on, Confederate veterans who died after the war were also permitted to be buried in and around Confederate Circle. On a personal note, while I am not generally a fan of generic rebel soldier statues, it is my opinion that the Confederate Circle functions somewhat as a corrective of perspective. The Civil War did not just affect wealthy people and was not just fought by generals. Most of the fighting and dying was done by men who might otherwise be forgotten. And indeed, it is a cruel fact that many people then and some today die unnoticed. According to the National Register of Historic Places registration form for Mount Olivet, there are thought to be quite a few unmarked graves of paupers, strangers, and slaves in certain sections of the cemetery. At the center of Confederate Circle is the grave of Colonel Adolphus Hyman, a Prussian-born architect who was influential in designing many Nashville landmarks, such as the Belmont Mansion. Over Hyman's grave now stands a 45-foot granite column, which was erected in 1889, 20 years after the original opening of Confederate Circle. This monument was also funded by the women of Nashville. Some controversy arose in 1905 when some citizens proposed moving it. But of course, their intent was to move it to Centennial Park in downtown Nashville so that it would be more visible. Ironically, it was the Daughters of the Confederacy, a group usually associated with making Confederate monuments more visible, who insisted on keeping it at Mount Olivet in its more sedate and tranquil location. Aside from Colonel Hyman, there are several other notable burials in and around Confederate Circle. Brigadier General Thomas Benton Smith, a West Point graduate and railroad man, was buried here in 1923. 
General Smith was a native of Rutherford County and spent many of his later years struggling with the long-term physical and mental effects of being beaten while attempting to surrender his men during the Battle of Nashville in 1864. Without casting judgment, it seems fair to say that Smith led a sad, lonely life in his later years. Not far from Smith is the grave of Mary Kate Patterson Davis Hill Kyle. She was married three times, so let's call her Mary Kate for short. Mary Kate was a Confederate spy in her own right, and was also sister-in-law of the Confederate spy Sam Davis. Davis and his group were considered something of martyrs and heroes by lost cause enthusiasts. Sam Davis, of course, being caught and hanged by Union troops in 1863. And there are many stories about Mary Kate hiding secret notes in tree stumps or in her dress, and while it is hard to separate fact from fiction, she was a clear example of the enthusiasm that many Tennessee women had for the Confederacy, both during and after the Civil War. Mary Kate was buried here after her death in 1931. Just outside of Confederate Circle are two other interesting graves marked by SCV plaques. The first one I'd like to highlight, which is due south of Confederate Circle, is for another woman, Adelicia Hayes Franklin Ackland Cheatham. She was also married three times. From her first husband, Adelicia Hayes inherited significant land and wealth. Together with her second husband, Colonel Joseph Ackland, she built Belmont Mansion near downtown Nashville. And although she lost her husband during the war, she made savvy business dealings which allowed her to preserve much of her wealth after the war. She was one of the few antebellum plantation owners who still had significant wealth after the Civil War. Just a few dozen yards west of Adelicia's mausoleum is the most austere of the seven general's graves at Mount Olivet, the modest stone for acting Brigadier General James Edward Rains. Rains was a Yale-trained lawyer and newspaper editor, and he was killed during the Battle of Murfreesboro on New Year's Eve, 1862. Rains was originally buried at the city cemetery, but was later reinterred here to be near the grave of his wife's family. To get to our final two graves on this part of our cemetery tour, we have to do some navigating. On foot, we can cut across section 13, and that's the section where Rains' grave is, to the path that separates sections 12 and 13. The grave of our final Confederate general, William Hicks Jackson, stands in section 13, facing section 12, so it's facing west. Jackson was raised in West Tennessee and was an 1856 graduate of West Point Academy. There is one word that summarizes William H. Jackson's Civil War and post-Civil War careers. That word would be horses. During the war, General Jackson, and I'm talking about William H., not the more famous Stonewall Jackson, but William H. Jackson commanded a cavalry division. After the war, he married Celine Harding, the daughter of the owner of Bellmead Plantation. After his father-in-law's death, he and his family turned Bell Mead into a renowned nursery for thoroughbred horses. William H. Jackson was also active in promoting agricultural interests during his later life. He died in 1903 at the age of 67. If we continue south along the path between sections 13 and 12, that's again heading south, we will get to the intersection of four paths, we are going to take the leftmost onto the path bordering the edge of the cemetery to section 15. Here we find the gravesite of another woman Confederate spy, Fanny Battle. Mary Frances Fanny Battle was born in 1842 into a large slaveholding family in the Cane Ridge area, which today is between Antioch and Nolensville. Fanny's father, Joel Battle, had grown wealthy as a plantation owner and also served as a soldier in the state militia. And he had also served for a time in the Tennessee State House. Fanny had at least seven siblings. When the Civil War broke out, her father Joel raised a company of men to fight for the South, and he later became colonel before himself being captured. Two of Fanny's brothers died in the Battle of Shiloh, and another brother was captured as a prisoner later in the war. A fourth brother also served in the war, but was neither killed or captured. During the Union occupation of Nashville in 1862, Fanny Battle began working as a spy for the Confederacy. For about a year, she and her future sister-in-law, Harriet Booker, 
were engaging in various spying activities, passing secrets on to uh, the Confederates about things that they had heard around town in Nashville. But in 1863, uh, she and Harriet were arrested by Union military police, and they were sent to a military prison in Ohio. Due to Fanny's intelligence, the Union military officials assumed that Fanny had to have been the ringleader of the Nashville spy network, although it's not clear that she actually was. After the Civil War, Fanny Battle became a teacher in the local public schools. In 1881 and 1882, when the Cumberland River flooded Nashville, Fanny Battle organized relief efforts for the homeless, and she helped form the Nashville Relief Society and United Charities. In 1886, she gave up her teaching job to focus on charitable work full-time. Today, Fanny Battle is best known for the daycare program that she started around the turn of the 20th century. Although Fanny Battle died in 1924, her charitable legacy continues. The Fanny Battle Day Home in Nashville still provides daycare for the working families of the area. And this concludes this part of our Mount Olivet Cemetery tour. In the next episode, I will focus on other famous people who are buried in Mount Olivet Cemetery who are not primarily associated with the Civil War. I hope you liked this video, and if you did, please give it a like and subscribe. While this channel is primarily a hobby for me, and I'm not asking for money or any other form of support, I would like to grow the community. It'll give me encouragement and give me a reason to get out and trudge around cemeteries in the future. Thank you very much.